All right, everybody, thank you all so much for joining us today for our discussion in regards to COVID-19 and the Delta variant. We are joined by Dr. Nestor Sosa, who is the Division Chief of Infectious Diseases here at UNMH. Um, we've had him prior in um, doing these trainings for us the, the past, I would say six months. And so we're so grateful for him to continue doing these trainings for us to educate us on the ongoing changes and what's happening with the Delta variant. He will be doing a short presentation and we'll have um, some time at the end. So if you have any questions that have been lingering for you with the ongoing changes with the Delta or COVID-19, this is the perfect time for you to ask those questions. You can place them in the chat or you can also use the Q&A section while I'll keep an eye on, on that. We are also live on Facebook for this session. So those of you joining us on Facebook, please also put that in the chat on Facebook and I'll keep an eye on that. Um, as we really want to make this as informative as possible. And so with that being said, thank you so much, Dr. Sosa, for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Teresa, and, and really thank you for inviting me. For me, it's really an honor, and I, I love these sessions because it allows, allows me to, to sort of be in contact with the community. And at the same time, I, I really thank you for all the work you, you are doing uh, here in New Mexico. I, I came here two years ago, and I feel really like at home uh, in Albuquerque and in New Mexico, so, so for me it's really um, a pleasure to be here. So let me let me share my screen. Um, let's see if I can put it in large screen. Perfect. Can you see the full screen? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna actually try to to talk about the a little bit of the up, update of the COVID nineteen epidemic. Um, with some emphasis on the Delta variant. And I'll try to, to explain some of this graph I, I present to the, to the scientists and uh, colleagues here at, at, at the university, but I'll try to, to explain as, as, uh, in, in, a, in a very understandable way. But obviously, if you have any questions, we'll have plenty of time for question and answer at the end, or if you have any particular aspect that I haven't really talked about, we, I'm, I'm more than glad to, to try to to, um, to answer the question if I can, because there are many things that we obviously do not know with this new virus. So let me let me minimize my the image of the photos and I'll go. Okay, so the first thing, I, I always like to sort of take a, sort of a perspective of, of, of this situation or any situation. And in the case of the pandemics, um, it's important to try to understand and compare uh, this current pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic, with the with other pandemics that we have had in the past, and and as far as we know, at least uh, there have been three or four pandemics uh, of respiratory viruses in the 20th and 21st century. And one way to measure the impact is actually to to uh, to measure what what is called the excess mortality. So you know, governments and health systems usually monitor how many people die every year. It's a pretty reliable uh, number because you know people get death certificates and it's reported, et cetera. So we know even in countries where there's no good diagnostics or or tests for 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 any disease because of the, the because they don't have the resources, they when somebody dies, it's recorded. It's it's, it's actually counted. So one way is to see how many more people have died uh, during the, the, the pandemic. It's a way to really measure objectively the impact. And let me show you, this is a study that a group uh, have done, a group of investigators, and it was published uh, in, the, in the scientific literature. But just to give you an idea, uh, there have been at least five pandemics since 1918 to the present. Uh, the first four were all secondary to influenza. So in 1918, the so-called Spanish flu, 1957, 68, the 2009, which was the H H1N1. Many of us remember uh, that uh, new virus and that pandemic a few years ago. And obviously in the latter part of 2019, 2020, and 2021, the COVID-19. These scientists, what they did, they adjusted the population of the world to the current 2020 population. Uh, and you can see the number, the, the number of total deaths associated with the pandemic. So in 1918 was the highest and it was 75 million uh, deaths uh, in the world. This is the whole, in the whole planet. And you can see the other pandemics, 3 million in 1957, 268, less than, than half a million in 2019. 
2009. And then this is our current um, estimate or the current estimate for the COVID-19 around 6 million. So it's obviously the most impactful pandemic with the exception obviously of the 1918. So that, that's important to understand because when people try to disregard uh, COVID-19, it's the same as the flu, uh, you know, it's just a, a common cold, et cetera. These, these have really made an impact on, on, on a lot of people, not, not only causing death in 6 million human beings, but also uh, producing some chronic uh, diseases like what, what it's called the long COVID um, or post-acute sequela of COVID-19. So, so I just wanted to give you that sort of uh, 35,000 feet perspective of the pandemic and the impact on mortality compared to other historic uh, pandemics that have occurred. The other uh, interesting or, or, or important uh, point of view is to see how the pandemic has behaved in the world. Sometimes we are centered in our in our city or our community, and we don't look at the at the whole um, um, planet. So this this is um, according to the to the World Health Organization. This is actually a graph of the cases of COVID throughout the the pandemic, and you can see that there have been at least three waves. One wave. Um, uh, was at the end of 2020, this was the, the big um, uh, or, or large uh, wave that occurred in basically in the United States and many other areas of the world um, at the end of 2020. Then we had another one in the spring, really very close together with, with the one in, in December. And now we live in the third wave. And this third wave, um, it's largely uh, um, driven by Delta, by this new variant. And I'm going to explain shortly what variants are. Um, so, um, <clears throat> because the virus is changing continuously, um, there are there are still people susceptible, and and this this is our our third wave. Which, by the way, it's it the tendency is to to go down. So it's starting to decrease, definitely um, decreasing in in many countries in the world. Uh, it's starting to decrease in some areas of the United States, but still. We have areas where there, there are many, many cases um, that are, are occurring. Obviously, you can see there were peaks and valleys. The valleys were actually associated with, because this was before vaccines, these valleys in the curve were associated with, with the social distancing and public health measures because vaccines were really introduced um, in some countries around February, March, uh, probably the U.S. was one of the earlier, Israel and the U.K., but many, many places in the world have not really started any significant, uh, the vaccination to any significant degree. Okay, so let's talk about variants, and, and we're going to concentrate, obviously, on the Delta variant. And the first question, what is, what is a variant, and, or why do variants occur? Um, so this is, this is an illustration of the virus. The virus... Um, has genetic material like, like any other living uh, organism. And, and there's a debate about the fact if our virus is alive or not. But in any case, for our discussion, they have either RNA or DNA. And this RNA and DNA, when, when the virus is replicating, there are uh, alterations and are illustrated here by these red dots. So there are minimal changes. Every time the virus replicate, there are some changes in their in their offsprings, some of these changes are irrelevant. They don't change the behavior of the of the virus or the consequences of the virus. But some other times, really, a new strain is is, um, is created or, or or appears, and and that new strain or variant we use the word variant for these uh, um, uh, modest changes. The, the new variant can be associated with either more transmissibility or more severe disease. And that what really distinguishes or, or, or makes a variant uh, a variant of concern or a variant of interest by the WHO when it's actually showing uh, different behaviors in human population um, due to the fact that it's spreading more rapidly than the previous or the parental strain, or it's causing more severe disease. A larger proportion of people end up in the hospital or with complication. So that's basically the reason why variants occur. Obviously, the more transmission, if there are a lot of people infected, there's a lot of replication or virus reproduction. And the more virus reproduction, the more variants um, appear in the community. So that's why it's so important to try it either with the vaccination or with non-pharmacological interventions like the social distancing, the masking, washing the hands, et cetera, uh, improving ventilation 
to decrease the appearance of these variants because these variants, um, as I said, can be difficult to control because the immune system do, do not recognize them uh, completely, uh, or they could be associated with more severe disease. <clears throat> what do we know about this Delta variant, which was, was actually described um, at the end of 2020 or discovered at the end of 2020 in India and rapidly uh, disseminated throughout the world. The first thing is, is that the Delta variant is associated with a higher amount of virus in respiratory secretion, a thousand times higher viral load or amount of virus in the nose or in the pharynx, so, so in, the rest, in, the, in the upper respiratory tract. And that probably explains why it's much more transmissible because if a person is infected, it will... Um, Share, uh, shed more viruses into the environment. It will, it will release more viruses when, they, when they're talking, when they're coughing, when they, they sneeze or sing. Uh, so any, any activity, even with breathing, they, they're gonna be putting more viruses into the environment and, and then other uh, susceptible individuals can get infected. And there's also evidence from, from different studies, uh, especially in Scotland, in the UK, uh, in India, that, that Delta is also associated with a higher degree, maybe a two to four time higher odds of hospitalization and admission into intensive care. So it's not only more transmissible in the way that more people get infected, but it's also associated with a, a higher proportion of hospitalization than the previous, the, the previous or older variants like Alpha and some other variants that circulated uh, in the 2020 um, waves. And, and actually, one way to see this transmissibility, the scientists have been able to calculate how many people on average a person with COVID infects. So with the original Wuhan virus, one infected person here illustrated in, in sort of a light blue color can infect two people. And in fact, in average infected between 2.4 and 2.6 um, individuals. This is obviously an average. There are people who infect Infect ten, uh, others who infect none, but a, a sort of an average or a mean of two point four to two point six. If we jump to Delta, Delta the estimates is that one infected person can can transmit the disease to to an average of five to eight uh, individuals. So really, a much more transmissible disease. Um, these levels of transmissibility are only seen with with like ch childhood diseases like mumps and measles. We don't really see that many other viruses with this high transmissibility. So Delta is right up there, slightly less than mumps and measles, probably similar to, to chicken pox. So it's very, very transmissible, especially if you compare with the origin with the original Wuhan virus or even with the alpha that circulated that circulated in, 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 uh, in the winter of, of 2021, which was um, infected four to five people. So this is almost double eight, eight uh, people for every person infected. Again, this is an average. Don't, um, I've seen cases of, uh, of large outbreaks where one person can infect 20 and other cases where one person infects no, no person. I mean, it basically doesn't transmit to other individuals. So this is sort of an average and it's very, very variable in the individual person. The other interesting um, fact is that Actually, the Delta has become rapidly the dominant strain. And this is the proportion of Delta variant in health region six, which includes New Mexico, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. And you can see the different dates here, May, June, July. And as late as the middle of May, most of the variants circulating was this one, B117, which is the alpha. So you can see the color, the light orange color, was the alpha the alpha was was king in that region six in the united states and in a couple of weeks just a matter of a few weeks delta became the dominant and essentially eliminated completely the other variants and you can see that almost um 100 of the samples are are um delta in this whole region of the of the united states if we look just at new mexico the same the same picture and these are the data from the genome sequencing that is done here by Daryl Dingwiddie and Daryl Doman at the university. And you can see there was a you know, mix of different colors, meaning different variants circulating in February, March, April, May. But then what happened in July and August, boom, the, the, the totality of the virus um, sequence in New Mexico are now belonging to the Delta. So it's basically taking over 
the transmission in, in our region without almost any, any exception. So that also speaks in favor of the high transmissibility because it basically more efficiently transmitted than other variants. So it, it's, it becomes a dominant really rapidly. Okay, let's talk now about vaccines and how, how Delta affects vaccines. First of all, um, we know from clinical trials that at least three vaccines are used in the United States. This is the Pfizer, BioNTech, that now is called Cominarty. The, the mRNA, which is the Moderna vaccine that is now called Spike um, vaccine. And we have the Johnson & Johnson, the j, j vaccine. So these are the three vaccines. When they were studied, they have pretty high efficacy. They were able to demonstrate almost perfect protection against disease, 95 and 94% for the two doses of, of the mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer and Moderna, and around 66 to 70% of the J&J, &J, which was only one dose, so it's uh, it's less number of doses, a single a single shot, but but a, a pretty decent protection. What we have seen with the uh, with the Delta variant, it's a it's a decrease in this efficacy of preventing disease, and you can see uh, how this number, the prevention of symptomatic disease, has really dropped uh, from the 95, 94 that was demonstrated in the original studies. Uh, to, to lower numbers. For instance, in England, it was calculated around 88, in Canada, 87, Scotland, 79, and Israel, which, is, which has the, the more uh, sort of somber data, the efficacy went down in one publication to 64. So there's no doubt that the Delta variant is impacting the, the frequency of symptomatic disease. So people who are fully vaccinated uh, definitely can get the infection, uh, but we will see that, that some things are not that... Uh, that bad. In, for instance, the, the hospitalizations and severe disease, uh, the protection doesn't seem to wane that much. So at least data from England and earlier in, in Israel, uh, 96 and 88 percent protection. So although um, we can get infected, even if fully vaccinated, uh, the risk of hospitalization is much less and we'll see some data uh, some additional data in favor of that. So, so the vaccine, the Delta variant seems to affect the capacity of the vaccine to protect to such a high level, 95, 94%, nevertheless protects you against hospitalization and death. And this is another way to put it, Eric Topol, which is the, the director of the Scripps uh, Institute in San Francisco, this is basically following the literature and these are all different sources of information and publications. And these are the vaccine effectiveness um, and, and you can see, for instance, in England, what I mentioned, 88%, but if you look at some of the most recent data are actually talking about 40 to 70% effectiveness against disease. Uh, a study in the Mayo Clinic, a study done in Qatar in the Middle East was also around 55 for Pfizer, 84 for Moderna. Uh, so definitely there's evidence of some uh, waning of protection. And that's the main reason why people are talking about boosters. And you have heard the the White House saying that there were going to be boosters available for, for the public in September, et cetera, because we are seeing some degree of waning of protection, especially among elderly individuals, people who are over 65, uh, and especially uh, patients or, or sorry, subjects who were vaccinated in January, February, so that they have been already vaccinated for eight or nine months. In those populations, there's some evidence of waning, but again, as I said, the, the waning of protection is against disease or against uh, asymptomatic disease, but not, not really that much against hospitalization, uh, ICU admission and death. The other concern that you have seen in the newspapers or in the news outlets, the concern about children, uh, and actually the CDC analyzed the data of the trends in COVID-19 cases uh, in children, uh, children and adolescents, basically zero to 17 years uh, in the United States from August 2020 to 21. And the good news is that number one, although there, there's obviously the, the large peak in December that I mentioned before, this is the cases in kids in different ages. So there was definitely a significant number of cases. These are cases per 100, uh, 100 people. Um, so the peak was around 50 for, per 100 uh, people in December. With the Delta, there's definitely another peak, but you can see that the peak is not as high as it was in December. So yes, it is true that Delta is affecting children um, more than if you compare to what was going on in February and April, much less number of cases in children, but still lower than the highest peak in December. So that, that's one piece of good news. And the other piece of good news 
This is the same data presented in a different fashion, but they also included the percentage of kids who actually made it into the ICU. And you can see the black line illustrates that percentage. And you can see that throughout the pandemic, there have been sort of a 20%, 20% frequency of kids going into the ICU. So yeah, there's have been a sort of an uptick with the Delta, but it have never surpassed the severity of the other variant. So although kids are affected, uh, the good news is that they're not more severely affected with the Delta uh, if we compare with Alpha that was around here and on some of the original Wuhan strains that were circulating here at the, at the end of 2020, okay? <clears throat> And then the, the other battle that we have seen is the vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Um, and, and we have heard the president and many other experts say this is an epidemic of an unvaccinated uh, versus vaccinated. So I'm gonna show some data of what happened when you're vaccinated and what happened when you're unvaccinated according to the, to the, to the data, to the evidence that we have. Uh, first of all, if you have been infected with the virus, there was a nice publication. If you have COVID and you're not vaccinated, you have pretty good, and sustainable antibodies. So obviously we, we always talk about the protection conferred by the vaccines, but having the disease also give you some protection. Although I have to, to mention this, once you have COVID, if you get the vaccination, your levels of antibody go really high. Actually, a lot of immunologists, a lot of experts said that if you if you had the infection and then you get vaccinated, you have the most powerful, the more the strongest immunity, which is called the hybrid immunity, because your your body has seen the virus, the real thing, and you have seen the vaccine, which is like the the purified version of the of the spike protein. So you have the best protection. But definitely, I mean, being infected gives you some degree of protection. Um, that, that may wane over time, but in this study, they, they actually measure antibodies out to 10 months after infection. And you can see the dots in the graph illustrate the, the levels of antibody. You can see that they remain relatively horizontal. There's not a significant decrease in the antibodies with natural infection. That, so that's important to mention the people who have had COVID have some degree of protection, which can be, again, as I said, improve a lot with vaccination. So even if you had COVID, and that's what they're recommending that you get at least one, ideally two doses to have the, the best protection, which is the hybrid protection. But let's see some data of unvaccinated people. And I like to illustrate this, this um, outbreak uh, was reported in the morbidity and mortality weekly report of the, of the CDC. In this case, and this is an illustration, this is a teacher in her class. These are the students in the class. And this teacher, was unvaccinated. Unfortunately, she was uh, unvaccinated. Um, and although they were all wearing masks most of the time, the kids were wearing masks, the teacher actually removed the mask to be able to read out loud to the, to the student. What happened? 12 out of 20, and she got COVID, and then almost half of the class, or exactly half of the class, 12 out of 24 got infected with COVID in that class. And you can see in red are those affected, and in gray, those who did not become, become infected. And you can see like in the front rows, the first two rows of the classroom, 80% of the kids got infected. So this clearly illustrates the risk of being not vaccinated because you can obviously spread it to, to people around you. And the second thing, if you remove the mask, the risk obviously increase, even if the kids have, um, have a mask on. So, so that's why it's so important for, the, for everybody you know, not just the student, but actually the teacher, and you can apply this to any other situation, uh, care, healthcare providers and their patients to wear a mask and also to be vaccinated. So that, that's the first sort of a sad story, but, but a real story. Uh, and even those on the back of the room, 28% uh, got infected. So three, um, 28 out of the students on the last three rows of the, of the classroom got infected. So that, that's important. And they were using open windows and some other uh, meetings but despite that, the teacher uh, unfortunately infected those kids. There's another study very recently published just a few days ago on September 10 by the CDC in which they actually compare vaccinated with unvaccinated individuals in 13 U.S. jurisdictions. So they, this was during the United States and during the Delta. And even with the Delta, people who are vaccinated versus or people who are not vaccinated have a five times higher risk of infection 10 times, more than 10 times higher risk of hospitalization and 10 times higher risk of death 
um, if you're unvaccinated compared to the vaccinated. Yeah, the vaccines are not 100%. There's infection. There are very true infections that have been well documented. But numerically, the risk is almost one lock or one um, order of magnitude greater if you're unvaccinated, your risk of hospitalization and death. And we have seen many reports of like 90, 95, 99% of people in hospitals right now are unvaccinated. And yes, you can see one person who, who's fully vaccinated and develop the disease and, and may even uh, have a complicated course and, and die, but that's the exception and not the rule. The risk is much higher if you have no immunity, zero protection from the, from the infection or, or because you haven't been vaccinated. And this is graphically the same thing. These are the graph of, of the epidemic, the so-called epidemic of the unvaccinated in black and vaccinated, and you can see that there are two different shapes. I mean, they, and this is July with the Delta peak. You can see, yeah, the vaccinated people, even, even fully vaccinated has some, some increase, some uptick in the number of cases, but the, the curve of the unvaccinated is way up here, 150 times, um, 150 per 100,000 cases. If you see hospitalization, it's even more dramatic. The, the curve of hospitalization in vaccinated, yeah, there's a small, trend here upwards, but you can see what happened in between June, June and July with the Delta variant in the United States, how, how this, this unvaccinated group actually uh, went up really significantly. And the deaths, the same thing, we have a increase in the death in the unvaccinated, barely no increase in the vaccinated. Not zero, but almost a, a negligible uh, amount of death in the, in, the, uh, in, the vac in the fully vaccinated population. So, so it's very evident um, uh, any way you look at this, that there's a difference between being vaccinated and being not and not being vaccinated regarding uh, cases, hospitalization, and that. And the final topic that I want to mention are the boosters. So are boosters really necessary? And, and actually today the FDA is discussing uh, the need for boosters. So we, we we have to stay tuned to the news uh, this afternoon when they they come up with with uh, more. Um, detailed recommendation or in the next few weeks, because actually I don't think they're going to reach a, a conclusion. Uh, but yeah, because of the waning of protection against infection, uh, people are considering the need for a, for, for a booster or a third dose to improve uh, immunity. And I just want to close the discussion reminding everybody about the safety, uh, because I have talked about efficacy, effectiveness, so, so how, how helpful the vaccine is, but it's important to mention um, the mRNA vaccines are extremely safe, uh, but there are some allergic reactions. There, there are people who develop severe allergic reaction. It's very infrequent, but we have seen that it's, it's a treatable condition. And that's the reason why when people are vaccinated, they have to wait 15 or 20 minutes after vaccination to make sure they don't have an allergy to the, um, to the, to the injection. There have been a lot of press about a transient myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart. Uh, this is usually reversible. It's seen in younger males, more than females, and younger patients. It's an inflammation of the heart muscle, which tends to be part of the reactogenicity or the, the, the fever and the, the symptoms that you feel with the second dose, and then it goes away. But it's something that it's, it needs to be considered and treated if, if, it, if it occurs. And finally, with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which belongs to this adenovirus vaccine, there's a rare, very rare complication of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia that, that is called VIT um, and also the Guillain-Barre syndrome. But these are really infrequent. And I actually gather from the literature the frequency. For instance, the allergic reaction, which is called in medicine anaphylaxis, the severe allergic reaction occurs 11 per 1 million people vaccinated. So 11 per 1 million. Myocarditis, 12 per 1 million. Uh, the thrombosis, 7 per 1 million. And the Guillain-Barre, 8 per 1 million. So you have to vaccinate a lot of people to actually see a few of these rare, extremely rare cases. And some of these things are totally treatable, like the myocarditis and the anaphylaxis are treatable conditions. And, and so is the Guillain-Barre. The thrombosis is a little bit more severe, but it's treatable also with, uh, with something called IVIG. Uh, so so we, we can recognize it on time and treat it if, if they occur. And as you can see, it's very infrequent. So in summary, we have um, living through the second deadliest pandemic in the last 100 years. So with the exception of the 1918 pandemic, uh, this has been the most important pandemic uh, in 100 years. Uh, we still see cases, 
you saw the, the, the peaks the, and valleys of the curve in the world. We're still seeing new cases and variants in other countries. I think we need to vaccinate the rest of the world to try to, to put a break on this pandemic, uh, or at least make it like an endemic uh, um, uh, disease that doesn't, that doesn't affect the health system. Definitely the del Delta variant that we are having, it's highly contagious. It's associated with more severe disease. Um, and it's also affecting to some degree the vaccine effectiveness. So that's the reason why uh, we're talking about boosters uh, now, nine months after we started vaccination here in the US. Uh, but remember, vaccines are highly effective. I have shown the, the so-called va vaccinated versus unvaccinated war. Um, and and, and even, even with the Delta, you, you get protection from hospitalization, severe disease, and death. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing and go into this question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sosa. This is a meeting-based uh, training, so you are more than welcome to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, we do have one question that was asked earlier um, about the RO for measles and mumps. Is that an average in an unvaccinated population or are there ROs for vaccinated populations as well? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, yes, this is an average in unvaccinated. So, so that is, they are not calculated for measles and mumps. It's from the historical times before vaccination. If, if a person with measles, let's say a student, gets into a classroom where nobody's vaccinated, nobody has had measles, they can spread the disease to that high number of people. But yeah, so those are historic. Obviously, if you're fully vaccinated with measles, your risk is almost almost zero, especially if, you, if you've been recently vaccinated, you're almost completely protected against measles with vaccination. But yes, that's a great question. Those numbers are sort of the natural the natural uh, ability of measles to or mumps to be transmitted in unvaccinated um, individuals. And, and to be honest, there, there are not changes also, although we, we take it as a, as a very reliable number, it's different. If you live in rural New Mexico and there's nobody around you and you get measles, you're probably not gonna spread it to anybody. But if you live in New York City, you know, and you ride the metro in New York City every day and you have measles, you're gonna infect 20 people uh, in that metro if they're not vaccinated. So, so R not, it has also, has to be adjusted to the reality. I mean, they, they incorporate um, the sort of a numbers to, to guide us, but in reality it's different for different population, different um, living conditions, et cetera. It's, it's, it's really not applicable to all situations automatically. Thank you so much for answering that question, Dr. Sosa. I do ha have Angie Estrellas with her hand raised. Yes, thank you, Teresa. Uh, Dr. Sosa, do you have a recommendation for, um, for weekly testing? We're a domestic violence shelter, so uh, weekly testing regardless of vaccination, vaccination status for the staff. That's one thing I've been wondering about doing as part of our safety protocols. Uh, do you yes. think that's too much? Is it a good a good um, idea for the shelter side of operations? Um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, there are there are a lot of experts who actually advocate for frequent testing, even in vaccinated individuals, because of the waning of the protection against infection. Even if all the staff and and all the residents in a in a facility are vaccinated. Um, the testing will detect those, especially those uh, with mild infections or, or infections that almost look like regular cold, with just like congestion and sneezing. Um, so yeah, so there, 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 there is that recommendation, and I think it's an added, uh, an added uh, value, an added prevention. This, I mean, fighting this virus, the best thing is is to put as many layers. Uh, or obstacles to the virus. So the vaccination is one obstacle, social distancing and masking when possible, when feasible, it's another, another layer of protection and definitely testing. And, and testing every week, it's, it's exactly what the CDC recommends. I do not recommend uh, less frequent testing like every couple of weeks or every three weeks because the, the incubation period of the virus is so short, it's four days, that if you have a person infected and you don't test in a week, when you test in two weeks, everybody, 
people be already infected or exposed. So it, it's not very useful. Um, and there are places like like we we here at the University of New Mexico, the the, the sports program tests uh, three times a week the the the, the athletes because it, you know an infection in a in a in a in a team is catastrophic because they they are together they train together they're they're like you know practicing and and actually sharing respiratory secretions all the time when they're when they're exercising so we do uh, testing two to three times a week to be able to detect as soon as possible um, so in normal condition and the CDC advocates testing every week that will detect um, infection even in vaccinated and definitely in unvaccinated individuals and will help uh, uh, rapidly isolate a person. Um, and also it's important to, to highlight the turnaround time. If you do testing, but the testing result gets back in three or four days, it's probably not very useful. It's better to use rapid testing or a rapid turnaround time, maybe less than 24 hours because of the transmission. The Delta is transmitted two days before symptoms uh, begin. Um, so if, if you imagine, if, if you test a person who's asymptomatic and you have to wait two to three days to get the results, they will, and, and, and to make the decision to put them on isolation or, or, or distance that person from the rest of the workers, um, it will be too late when, when the result comes back in three days, he's already infected three or four more that you have to do. And then the same thing with the rest. So it's the, the faster, the turnaround time, the better. And definitely it's another layer, another help. And they're actually very, uh, uh, experts who are actually advocating for 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 more, more testing that we, we have been really we haven't been at that aggressive with testing in the United States. We had that issue at the beginning. Maybe somebody remembers the problem with the there was no te diagnostic testing and it was so hard to get. And we never got really on top of that uh, and got used to testing. But there's a lot of places uh, in Europe and and in other places where they test very frequently. Everybody, I mean, in the in a especially in, in, in uh, work uh, or, or, or uh, companies, factories, schools, et cetera. Just a follow up then. So on our um, non-shelter side, we have staff in an administrative building, which you also advocate for weekly testing uh, of those staff if they're coming in. It's a smaller group and clients aren't coming in right now. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a way to overtest. Really, it depends on your budget, how inconvenient, how difficult it is. I'm not obviously familiar with with your uh, with your system, with your shelters, etc. Uh, to give you sort of a, a categorical, but I can tell you there's no way to overtest if if I mean, if if, it, if it's very disruptive, if it's, if, it, if it's affordable to the funds that you have, you will definitely pick up uh, some cases. Obviously, also the strategy has to be related to what's happening in the community. If we have a very active transmission in the community. Um, obviously, testing will be more, uh, more. Uh, you will get more money, more bug for your money, you know, you, more benefits of testing. If the, if the curve is really down and there are no transmission in the community, then you're probably not going to get as many um, meaningful positive tests and you may even get false positive and, and get more confused. But if you have, you know, an outgoing, uh, you know, an active transmission in the community, then that's, that's definitely a useful, especially if people share the same space uh, and, and, and they are exposed to each other is definitely a, a way, but it, it, it's always a decision of cost, um, inconvenience, et cetera. But I, I think there's no way to over test. There's no risk to testing. Uh, you know, physical risk. I mean, the the swap uh, has really not not is it's completely harmless. Um, so yeah, so that it's it's something that may be helpful, and and it's never uh, it's never uh, too much. It, the we were going to use the vault system, which is a saliva test. Do you know anything about the the rate of, of false positives? Or no, false specifically, negatives? I cannot speak specifically, but I know the saliva tests have been validated in many settings. So it's it's another useful test. I mean, tests always have uh, limitations. No matter what test you do, you will have false negative, you will have false positive. Uh, but if you do it frequently, if you if you are on top of you know what's happening in your in your community, uh, it's useful. Usually, a useful uh, thing to do. And will, as I said, add another another layer of of protection to your to your coworkers or your your um, public or or yeah. Thank you so much for your questions, Andrew. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sosa. Thank you. Um, the next one, my screen moved a little bit, so I apologize. Um, the next one that I see with their hand raised is going to be Dolores Lewis. 
Hi, good morning. Um, I just wanted to know that if you, can you get the Delta variant if you've already had like the other COVID, um, COVID virus? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. The answer is yes. There have been uh, cases of what we call reinfection, people who, who actually had um, COVID in, let's say, March, April, June, July of last year, and they have developed the Delta variant, uh, infection with the Delta variant. Yes, it, it is possible. Uh, obviously, if you have COVID, you have more protection than if you have not have COVID before. You you know, when, with natural infection, you get exposed, you develop some antibodies. So probably your your overall risk, if you had COVID last year or or at the beginning of this year, it's better than a person who has never had contact with the virus. That that's a, that's a fact we know because we have measured the antibodies. We have seen the the immune system actually active against the virus. But unfortunately, it's not 100%. So there are people who, despite having COVID before, can uh, develop what we call a reinfection or a second infection. And that's what the CDC and, and all of the experts recommend, that even if you have COVID, to get a shot. Because there are people who say, oh, I had COVID. I don't need the shot. I don't need the vaccine. There's a lot of evidence, not, not one study, probably 10 or 12 studies in different countries, which show how well protected you are if you had covid and then get a shot. Uh, and, and then you have like a really like a huge booster because the, 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 the immune system has seen both. I've seen the virus and now have seen the, the spike protein in the, and, and, and it develops very robust antibodies and, and, and immune defenses against the virus when you have, when you have the, and, and actually we, we call it hybrid immunity, like the hybrid cars, because you have both immunity to the virus itself and immunity to the to the vaccine, and that seems to be the best um, the best protection. But unfortunately, if you if you had COVID, you still have the risk of of developing a second infection. Actually, if, if you want a number, the, the the there have been studies done in healthcare workers, and it's around eighty percent protection. So the protection of of infection gives you like an eighty percent. It's not as good as an mRNA vaccine, which presumably is 94, 95. But it's right up there. Eighty percent is it's it's good. It's it's some protection. So so you 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 have some degree of protection, but it's not perfect. So you can still get it. You can still transmit it, even if you had it once. You can you can have it twice. Um, can you still get the Delta variant if you're vaccinated? Yes, yes, that's a good question. Let me just reiterate. Yes, they have been, and we call the breakthrough infection. People who were vaccinated uh, can have an infection, but the infection. Infections, number one, are usually milder, shorter in duration, less likely to transmit, less likely to, to uh, become severe and go to the hospital. But yes, you can have the Delta variant, unfortunately, despite being vaccinated. But again, it's risk. It's, it, it, it's, and, and use the analogy of, of the seatbelt or the helmet. If you're riding your, your bike or a motorcycle without the helmet and you have an accident, your chances of surviving are much much less if you hit your head against the ground at 40 miles or 50 miles, you're probably not going to survive that impact. If, if you have the helmet, you may not survive. You, you may have some other injury that kills you, but the helmet gives you a protection. The same happens with the vaccine. It's not perfect, but it's much better than having no protection against the Delta. So yeah, unfortunately, it is true. You can get infection with Delta if you're vaccinated, but numerically, uh, it's, less, it's less of a risk of getting it of transmitting it to other people, and also if you get it, to go to the hospital and die. It's not zero, but it's much less than, than not having the vaccine um, uh, before. But great question. <clears throat> Thank you for answering that question. Um, the next one that I have up is gonna be Andres Garcia. Thank you, Dr. Sosa. I work in a high traffic area. Is Has there been any updates to any studies about transmission through surface area? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, no, there hasn't been any, any, um, any uh, updates. Um, if anything, I think the, the feeling is that um, objects, inanimate objects or surfaces are less of a problem than we thought at the beginning of the pandemic. We all remember, you know, the, the high buying Clorox or one of those things. And I, I myself put my shoes when I got from the hospital, I put my shoes like in a, in a special container in, in my door at the house before entering my house, et cetera. Now we know that probably over 90% of the transmission is to respiratory secretions. When you talk, 
when you sneeze, when you uh, sing, when you do, even when you breathe, you are expelling into the air these microscopic uh, little drops that actually can be inhaled by a person in front of you. Even at, at longer distance, there have been outbreaks in restaurants in when the infected person was in this corner of the re restaurant and the other one that got infected from, from that index case, it's on the other side because there's some like very light particles that we expel when we breathe that are weightless. They basically float in the air and they can stay in the room. So yeah, so although we, we there, there is transmission associated with surfaces, with objects like, you know, doorknobs and things, we think now that it's much less than at the beginning. It's not zero. You cannot like disregard. No, don't wash your hands. Don't clean surfaces. Not, that's not what I'm saying. But probably most of the transmission occurs some other way, especially to respiratory. So you, you still have to, if you have an infected person uh, in an office, you have to disinfect, you know, the keyboard, the computer, the area, you have to clean the floor because the virus drops into the area. And, and in case you touch that area and then you bring your, your, your finger to your nose or your, you know, scratch your eye, you can be infected uh, that way. It's probably not that frequent, but it happens. And that's what we also insist in all these other layers, hand washing, surface cleaning, uh, using the, the alcohol gel, because there's there's some 10% of transmission that occurs that way. But most of the transmission is through respiratory route, through the respiratory route. And that's the insistence with the mask and with the social distancing, because you're trying to, to put some barriers for the virus to, to cross uh, for the infection to be successful. But it's a, it's a good question, Andres. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I do have a follow-up question. Just we'll ask it just because it pertains to this question. Um, you stated that you know the transmission is by sneezing, by coughing, talking, singing, all of that. We do have mm -hmm. a question that states: How long do those particles last in an enclosed area, either on a plane, in an office, in a car, or just a small area that? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think the scientists have a, a magic number. It depends on many factors, and I'm going to explain the, the factors. Actually, uh, number one is the ventilation of the room, just to mention the first one. If you have uh, you know, a very good air conditioning, if you have uh, HEPA filters in the air system, if you have open windows and open doors, um, the, the, the duration of those particles in the air are much less. Okay, if, you, if you're in an enclosed environment, very small room, no air circulation, uh, they can last and they can last for hours. Uh, I think they have, I've seen experiments in which they can last in the air for, for 12 hours, imagine. So almost half a day uh, in, the, in, the, in the perfect condition. This is humidity, darkness, et cetera. There's some uh, things that, thank God, they don't happen all the time. I mean, there's always uh, some type of air circulation, uh, dispersion. Uh, so yeah, so, so it can last for a long time. So uh, I have a friend, uh, a colleague who actually, when, when he sees a patient with COVID, um, he opens the windows on the door for a few minutes, try to see the next patient in another room before going back into the original room. I mean, that's probably a lot of, a lot of you know, complication, but um, because he, he's an infectious disease and he sees COVID patients every day. And, and he also say, tells the house staff, if they enter that room to wear an N95, because that person was there breathing for you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, the time that the, that the visit, the medical visit lasted. Uh, and probably in the air of that room, there's going to be some virus. Um, the opposite end, it's, it's, it's an outdoor sunshine, wind blowing event. If you go to, uh, to the Domingo Baca Park, uh, you know, uh, at noon, uh, it's probably less risk if, if you compare that with my, my small office here, which is completely closed and with air conditioning. So, so it's sort of, a, you know, there's a lot of variability how, how long the infectious virus, but definitely last for minutes to hours in an enclosed environment with ideal condition. And that's why it's so important to improve ventilation, to try not to crowd in places like bars and restaurants, which are, you know, a lot of people in a small uh, confine and they're usually shouting and singing and, you know, very happy with their margaritas. <laughs> so they're sharing their opinions uh, uh, actively and, that, and they're also sharing their virus. If one is infected, everybody else is gonna be breathing that, that happiness <laughs> uh, with the virus. Uh, so it's important to, to, to point out, I suppose if you're by yourself in, a, in an open space in a park, the risk is basically zero because the, the chances of inhaling a particle there with the virus is probably negligible. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering that question. The next hand, I will get to the ones that are in the chat. Um, we do have April Armijo with her hand raised. 
Hello, Dr. Sosa. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It's a lot of excellent information and thanks for answering the question about. Oh, I think you muted. <laughs> yeah, April, you muted yourself. Oh, yeah. oh hi, yeah. sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I was saying that, you know, this is excellent information and you're really putting it all together in a, a good way that we all can understand. And thanks for answering my question about the R naught for mumps and measles, because I've always wondered that. Uh, but I have two more questions and I'll try to keep them short. Uh, I know early on the FDA gave the EUA for rapid antigen tests, but only in symptomatic patients. And I know the PCR is still the gold standard, but at this point, like with the, uh, the sports program, are they using antigen tests for asymptomatic patients or people too? And is that okay or encouraged? And the second question is, um, uh, reinfection rates. I know early on the DOH was, you know, they're compiling information and they had some numbers that seemed alarming, but, you know, the ratio of reinfections to the population, like you needed more data and they didn't have it at the time. Do you know about rates for reinfection and what you currently see in practice? Yeah. And like, you know, how, how often does that happen? Okay, good question. Yeah, for, first of all, about the antigen test. Um, Definitely antigen tests are uh, less sensitive than PCR tests. That's number one. So if, if you, I mean, if, if you can afford and you can have a rapid, re, rapid re, uh, turnaround time with a PCR, PCR would be better. Uh, although uh, that said, antigen tests are sensitive enough to be very helpful, especially if you do them frequently. And that's, you know, more than once a week or at least once a week. Um, it's very useful uh, and, and definitely have demonstrated um, the ability to detect early outbreaks and, and try to abort uh, outbreaks in, in small communities and in, in, in like uh, sport facilities, et cetera. And there are also a lot of evidence or not a lot, but there's some evidence that uh, especially for symptomatic individuals of, of, the, of the FDA recommendation, if you're tracking people with symptoms and use an antigen, is very useful because it, in that case, um, it will be positive most of the time. So the sensitivity in, in people with symptoms, symptomatic individual is very, very high. So, so yeah, so it, it's sort of a, a trade-off. If, if you can get away do, with doing uh, PCRs and having a rapid response, PCR is best, is more specific and more sensitive, but a lot of people and a lot of systems do not have that, that luxury and they have to rely on antigen. Antigens are good enough for 80 to 90% uh, sensitivity. So you're gonna miss some cases, but if you do it frequently, that case that you missed the first day because the viral load was very low, you're gonna pick up the following, the following testing cycle. So, so you're probably still gonna uh, derive some benefits uh, from doing frequent antigen tests. And so, so yeah, so frequency in, in this case, um, overrides or, or compensates for the lack of sensitivity compared to the PCR. The, the, the second question, the reinfections, I don't have a magic number. What I can say are the, the what they have calculated based on, on healthcare workers and other people who have had two infections. Um, the estimate of protection from infection, as I said, is 80%. So you can you know, look at it the other way. There's a 20% risk of reinfection. If you, if you were infected, you have a 20% uh, um, protection or so, sorry, lack of protection uh, or, or risk, residual risk of having uh, reinfection. I think it depends on several factors. Number one, the severity of infection. If you had a very mild uh, infection, almost uh, uh, asymptomatic infection, probably your protection is less than if you had a real, you know, struggle with COVID in 2020 or the early 2021, your immune system will probably be better off and you have less chances of having a second infection with Delta or, or whatever variant comes down the line. So that's one, severity of disease. Also the time, if, if your infection was in March of 2020, you know, you probably have some waning of the, of the protection and, and, and it's been a year, a year and a half uh, since that original infection. And you probably have more risk if some, compared to somebody who had the infection in June that have less than, than four months. So that person still have a pretty robust immune system. So those factors affect the reinfection rate um, and, and, and to be honest, it's a little bit hard to calculate the reinfection rates for several reasons. First, because a lot of people do not document the first infection. There's a, um, in, in many places where people have, they, they felt they 
had COVID, but there was no documentation of that first COVID. And then also the people who have like a persistent positive PCR and it can confuse a second infection with just the first infection lasting longer. Uh, so so that, those are practical difficulties studying the frequency of, the, of reinfection. But I would say in general, infection confers protection probably around 80%. It wanes over time. So the longer um, it, you have, the time has spent since your original infection, the less protected you are. And also depends on, on your first infection. If your first infection was really mild, you, your protection is probably not 80%, but maybe 60 or 50%. If you had a symptomatic severe infection, you're more protected down the, down the road. Thank you so much. I just wanted to clarify, what does PCR stand for? It stands for polymerase chain reaction. And I'll explain briefly what they do uh, in the lab. Um, they take, they take the, the sample and they actually, there's a way to, to try to, to, do, uh, to detect if there's RNA present or, and how much is present by doing what we call a polymerase chain reaction. There's an enzyme that actually builds the RNA in the in the test tube, if there's RNA present. So if there's like the the um, the original virus, you can you can actually make more using this polymerase, which is the name of the enzyme. So it's just the name of the reaction, the polymerase chain reaction, and and it's done at high temperatures because it was discovered in a in a in a in actually in a bacteria that lives in 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 vents in hydrothermic vents. So it's very interesting the history of the PCR, but it's it's just to detect the presence of, of genetic material. And it's using many, it's not only using virology, it's using, uh, if you guys have seen CSI, the, you know, the police thing, you can detect human DNA in a crime scene by using PCR. So it's used for many, many, uh, uh, it has many uses, this PCR reaction, but it basically detects RNA or DNA uh, of living organisms in a, in a sample, in a crime scene, in a, in a tissue, even in a, in a prehistoric mammoth, they, you can find the DNA of the mammoth and try to, to study that DNA uh, in an archeological finding or paleontological study. So it's very interesting, but it's just to detect RNA and DNA. Thank you so much for clarifying. I do see two more hands raised, but we do have a couple of questions um, in the chat. So Rose is asking for people who smoke, are there any specific side effects anticipated from getting COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there's actually sort of a debate in the literature. There have been studies in which um, smoking have been associated with more severe lung disease. Um, there were some studies that they didn't see that association. So it's, it's, it's either uh, neutral or a, a deleterious or negative effect. Obviously, if the person have chronic lung disease, if they have, you know, they have cigarette smoking and they already have bronchitis or emphysema, uh, secondary to the smoking or, or or even lung cancer, obviously they do much worse with COVID because COVID is a lung infection on top of a lung disease is like much more more difficult. Uh, but maybe you know it, it, somebody who doesn't have any any lung disease may not fare that bad if they're smokers, especially early in their in their life. If they're young and they're smokers, there's probably not not that much of a difference. But definitely, if you have lung, if you have cigarette induced lung disease. Is definitely a risk factor for more severe severe COVID. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Soledad Aguilbe. Yes, Dr. Sosa. Is it safe to test on a weekly basis? I mean, um, for the body, is it? Is it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Good question. Most of the first of all, most of the rapid tests and the tests that are available commercially. Uh, they really go into the just the opening of the nose, so it's really not, and it's with a with a plastic or a Q-tip type of thing. It does no harm. I mean, the worst case scenario, if you do it very, you know, very hard, you can have a little bit of bleed. Uh, but even we worse than poking your nose like like kids do all the time. It's not as I mean, there's really no. With the previous test with the nasopharyngeal that's done by nurses or by doctors, it's a little bit deeper. Uh, and there have been very rare complications, nose bleeds and other complications, but you have to really go deep to do damage. I mean, if you just go to the entrance of the nose with a Q-tip and do, you know, a quick, uh, you know, movement in there, it's probably completely harmless if you do every week. There's really no, no evidence of harm. And as I said, I said, you know, humoristically, but it's almost like, you know, poking your nose, you know, that, that's the risk of, 
of, of doing this with a, with a sterile Q-tip is probably no risk at all. The risks are really not related to physical harm, but to misinterpreting the test. If you get a test and it's negative and then you go to a bar and you get COVID the following day, then the test gave you a false sense of security. So you were, you know, we're harmed by the by the field sense of like, oh, I didn't have COVID, so I'm going to go party. That's a risk uh, of the test. Or the other way around, you have a positive, a false positive. You have a test that is positive. You were not really infected. You're going to spend ten days at home, uh, you know, quarantine or whatever uh, with a false positive. Test. That's the other risk of the test. Of, of doing tests that are not perfect, but that's part of fighting the pandemic. Not everything can be perfect 100%. Uh, so so the, those are the real risk of testing, you know, false positive, uh, false false negative, and also the the, the, the sense of, of, oh, I didn't get COVID, so I'm going to go to this bar, and then you get COVID the, the following day after the test, because the test is not able to protect you from COVID, uh, and it doesn't tell the future neither. So it, it's just that moment. It, it cannot predict the future. Uh, with a test. Thank you so much. All right, so we're now heading over to the rest of the questions in the chat. Uh, one of them is, do the booster shots address the Delta variant? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually scientifically debated right now. Um, there are at least that I have seen three or four studies of boosters already, and the protection conferred by the booster seems to address the Delta variant. I mean, the number of antibodies that you get uh, from the vaccine seems to be protected against the Delta variant. And there's data from Israel, which is like brand new data in which they already started vaccinating 65 and older. And you can see that those vaccinated, that the incidence of Delta have really, you know, sink dramatically, have gone down dramatically with the booster. As opposed to people who had not received the booster, they still keep getting Delta, getting Delta, getting Delta. Those who received the booster are going down in their frequency. So yes, the answer, the, the booster, and despite the, the booster being from the old virus, it was made with the old virus, with the original virus, it's giving protection um, to the Delta variant. And we hope that to other variants that are coming in the next few weeks or month, uh, because, because of the sheer number of antibodies that you produce after you get this third third dose or booster shot. And that, that's what the scientists who are pro-boosters are arguing. Like if you get this booster, you're not gonna get, uh, or your chances of getting a breakthrough infection are most le much less. And so in, in that way, even if you don't get a severe disease, you're protecting the people around you. If you work with susceptible hosts, like I do um, with sick individuals or people who have like different underlying conditions, I am protecting them by getting the booster myself. Because even if I don't get a disease, uh, they may get a severe disease from me. So if I don't get infected, they don't get infected. They don't have a severe disease neither. So that, that's the rationale behind uh, some of the pro-boosters um, uh, scientists. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Um, how concerned should an individual who had COVID, the Pfizer vaccination, and now is having food allergies, should that individual have an EpiPen available? Right. There's first of all regarding the allergies, there is not a clear association with any specific allergy and the allergies to the vaccine. The only association is with the vaccine itself or its component. So if you're allergic to bee stings, to food, to peanuts, to uh, selfish, or any any type of allergy um, by itself, that doesn't predict that you're going to be allergic to the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. Um, in general, people who are very allergic, and that's have been seen in the in the vaccination surveillance studies. If you're if you are allergic to some to something, anything, you're more likely to have a reaction. But there's, but there's no clear relationship. If I'm allergic to shellfish, I'm allergic to Pfizer. If I'm allergic to to bee stings, I'm allergic to Pfizer. There's no such a, an association. And, and uh, in general, a lot of people who are allergic get the vaccine and nothing, nothing really happens. The great majority, nothing, nothing happens to them. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any specific um, you know, provision except for the usual, when you get your vaccine, don't run, out, don't run home right away. Stay near the vaccination site just in case they need to give you like a Benadryl or, or epinephrine or something. If you develop itching or some type of, of immediate allergic reaction, it can be treated right, right there and then. 
Thank you so much for answering that question. The last question I think is very relevant at this point because some of us are parents. Um, so if a child is exposed at school and now has to quarantine for 10 days, um, are all his members ex and all his mem like family members are exposed, do they have to also get tested? Yeah, that's, it's really complicated to be honest. Even for me, who I, I read the, the CDC website like once a week just to see what they come up. It's a bit complicated, but if you're fully vaccinated and you are exposed, and I'm going to talk in general, exposed to a, to a child or to a person, um, uh, number one, you, you have some degree of protection. What you have to do if you've been exposed um, and it's a close contact, you need to, to isolate, but you can... Um, sort of get out of isolation if you have a negative test after five days. So you wait the five days of incubation period, you do a test like an antigen test or rapid test or even, or even a PCR. And if that PCR test comes back negative, you can be taken off isolation because you were exposed, but you were not infected. Uh, if you do not test, you have to isolate for 10 days uh, or at least monitor your symptoms for, for, for 10 days and definitely uh, there's an extra recommendation of wearing a mask. If you have, if you're an essential worker, you have to go back. You have to wear a mask for for at least 14 days after you've been exposed, just for common sense to put another layer of protection on on the subject. But I rec I strongly recommend people to review the the CDC guideline because it's 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 nuanced and there's a lot of details there. Uh, if you're vaccinated, if you're unvaccinated, if you're symptomatic, if you're asymptomatic. So there's a lot of uh, different. Uh, situations that, that you need to pay attention to. Uh, but, but yeah, but definitely uh, it, it's a situation that we see frequently and, and it's, you know, you have to apply common sense and also follow the rules of the CC to try to decrease uh, infection. But there is a way at least to shorten the, the isolation by, by testing negative. And even if you're, if you're the quarantine and if you're in isolation uh, and you test negative after seven days, you can also get out of quarantine, which is another, I'm sorry, get out of isolation. I keep confusing quarantine with isolation, which are different things. So quarantine is, is for people who have been exposed and isolation is for people who are, who are infected. That's the difference. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, there's more, a couple of questions have popped up. Um, so somebody has been looking at some data about hives because of the COVID vaccine. So it's been about three months. Um, do you recommend to take steroids or wait six months to see if how long that will last or should they you know, should they get the, the booster vaccine or not? These are hives associated with the vaccine? I'm assuming yes. Okay. Yeah, in that case, I would recommend for him to consult with the physician, I mean, with the, with their primary care, because there, it depends on what type of reaction they had. If it was an immediate reaction or a delayed reaction. So there's a lot of details there. Um, I can, th there have been a couple of studies on people who have severe reactions and they got the second dose and, and nothing happened. But I would definitely, I, 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 I don't like to give a recommendation in that case, um, because I think it, it has to be consulted with your physician so he can gauge the severity of the reaction, the immediacy of the reaction. In general, we don't use steroids because steroids by itself can blunt the, the advantage of the vaccine. So that, that's, that's what I said, this is a decision you need to make with your, with your primary care provider. Um, uh, it's hard for me to to say, okay, have hives, you know, with with the vaccine, what to do next, um, and 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 they, they, if the case is really complicated, they, they may even get an allergist or an immunologist to actually uh, be consulted before you get the second dose, or the booster or the third dose. In this case, which we're already down to the third dose. So yes, but that that will be something that I have to to individualize and 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 see what to do. Perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, the next question is, how soon will vaccines be available for 12 years and younger? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, last week, the Pfizer people actually said that they had the, the dossier, the information ready to be submitted to the FDA. I have heard from like uh, um, FDA uh, representative in the media saying that probably by the end of October, beginning of November, because if they present the data now at the end of September, they usually take a month to read through it, you know, reanalyze, check it. So, you know, base case, base case scenario, um, beginning of, of November for 11, from, from like six to 11. Um, 
much more time for less than six years old. Uh, but it could take longer. I mean, if they find something and they need to go back to the to Pfizer and say, give me more information about this, it's another couple of weeks of information going back and forth between the company and the and the, and the FDA. So so I wouldn't really be uh, you know that optimistic that, that it's going to be the best case scenario. But according to the prediction, it's going to be somewhere in November, maybe the beginning of November, that we'll have uh, the, the the EUA for for uh, six to eleven years. Um, I think it, it yeah it, it we have to we have to actually wait. I think one co country already approved it uh, in in six to eleven, but but we have to wait and see how how long the FDA. But I think it's going to be at the end of the year. Um, we're going to have that, and a little bit longer for the little kids. Thank you so much. One of the last questions that we have on the chat is if your partner and you are both vaccinated, but both are positive and in isolation, can you reinfect each other? And also what is the chance of relapse back into symptoms past recovery? Okay, let me take the first one and then you repeat the second one. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Nobody have really answered that. I think it's unlikely, unlikely if you have the same variant, let's say both are vaccinated, both get uh, one get delta, uh, the, uh, the other one gets delta. It's going to be hard to reinfect each other with the same variant, especially in a short period of time, because you're protected by the vaccine and now by the by the natural infection. So it's 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 very very unlikely. Um, if on the other hand, one person both are vaccinated, but one person gets infected, they can they can infect the the partner. So if if uh, yeah, there have been infections even from vaccinated people in house. So a vaccinated person can infect another vaccinated, uh, definitely can infect another unvaccinated individual even easier, but it can also infect another vaccinated. I, I saw an outbreak in uh, Singapore, which they actually map out who was vaccinated, who was not, and there were inst instances of, of transmission between vaccinated individuals. So they can they can infect each other. It's less likely, but it's, it's possible, unfortunately, especially if they were vaccinated uh, in January or February, six or or nine months away uh, ago. What was the second question about? <laughs> yes, of course. The second question was um, also, what is the chance of relapse back into symptoms after you recover? Like, I guess the chances of having the symptoms again after recovering. In yeah, that's a good question. I, and I'm, I'm going to talk about long COVID because really, I mean, once you recover, uh, it's very unlikely for the symptoms to, to come back when you recover. What happens? frequently, probably 20, maybe 30% of people who have symptomatic COVID do not recover completely. That's the, that's the plain truth. They develop this so-called long COVID in which they, they still experience uh, symptoms, either respiratory, like cough, shortness of breath when they exercise, mental uh, fog or, or, or confusion. They're not able to like uh, read a book in the afternoon because they fall asleep. They're not able to do Sudoku puzzles because they're not as sharp as before um, and those type of things. Uh, and, and, and there are people who have other symptoms like loss of sense of smell for longer period of time. So there's a whole array of manifestations of, of this so-called long COVID that, that can occur after the acute infection. So you have the fever, the cough, you were in the hospital, they gave you oxygen, you go home, and then you don't completely go back to your normal self um, for a month. And that's all. That's called the long COVID. At the beginning, we didn't know what it was, but now we know it's well established. And there are different types of long COVID. There are people who have like respiratory symptoms, or they have cardiac symptoms, or they have mental fog, or they have, you know, different manifestations of of this long COVID. Is something real? And 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 researchers are actually actively seeking ways to help people with these long symptoms because it's. We, we don't understand what's going on. We don't know if it's like the virus stays in the body longer or is the immune system that is hyperactive and it's not allowing them to feel back to normal. There are people who recover, but even kids, uh, young kids develop long COVID. I have uh, heard or, or read about uh, kids that were like, you know, football stars in their high school. And after COVID, they're not able to run 100 yards. They're like really crippled. You know, they can go to school, but they don't have the same uh, physical ability than before. Uh, because of the COVID, and they're like slowly recovering, but they're definitely not uh, as active or as healthy as they were before COVID, and that's the so-called long COVID, or or now they, they try to call it post-acute COVID syndrome, which is sort of a, another fancy name for long COVID. 
All right, perfect. Well, I hope that all of your questions were addressed. This is why the, re you know, the reason why we had this training, um, there was a lot of interest in past trainings and we really wanted to offer it again, not only for our programs, but for our community members. So they can also get their questions answered by watching this. We are sharing this on Facebook as mentioned. This will also be uploaded to our YouTube channel if you wanna check back in with us and let us know your feedback as well. Again, Dr. Sosa, we just really appreciate you at the coalition. Thank you so much for always making time for us. Um, and having these trainings and these sessions. Um, it has been really fantastic for our programs to get answers for our survivors and for our advocates as well, right? Like COVID-19 and Delta variant has been a really <laughs> chaotic time and ongoing changes. And, you know, it's, it's just really affected us entirely. And so we just really thank you for taking time. And I hope everybody has a fantastic day. And let me know if you all have any questions and or concerns after this training. I will put my email in the chat if you have any concerns. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Sosa. We really appreciate your time. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you very much for inviting me. And, and I just want to close with, with just a word of optimism. I, I'm sure we're going to overcome this pandemic and, and we will feel proud of all the effort and all the, the work that we put in. Uh, to help our people during the, this pandemic, during these difficult uh, times, um, we'll look back and, and say, okay, we, we did it the best we could with, with the information that we had. We were so sketchy and with all the all the problems that we have experienced of misinformation and everything. So thank you again for all you do in the community and, and you know, I'm, I'm available whenever you need me. Thank you very much. Thank I'll be you. here in my office. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, everybody have a fantastic day. Have a good weekend, take care. <laughs>